Throughout human history, man's relationship with nature has been a fight for survival. The events you are about to see are real. There are no reenactments, no actors, just real people confronting extraordinary situations. This is the story of our struggle, of man against nature. Man has long had a love affair with the water. Powerboat racers battle each other side by side over rough water at speeds up to 145 miles per hour, often with dangerous consequences. In accidents like these, rescuers play a crucial role. They race to the scene of a crash, pulling victims to safety. The red lights have changed to green, and it's Steve Curtin. In Malaysia, crowds have gathered to watch South African powerboat champion Peter Lindenberg, who is known for pushing himself to the limit. Within seconds, Lindenberg opens up the throttle and emerges from the pack. Really having an excellent run because he's taken the lead. But this time, Lindenberg catches too much air. But look at this. A boat, yes, upside down between turn one and turn two. And we have a unique... John Goodwin and Andy Newton are members of the Osprey Racing Team, the sport's premier rescue group. They know that with a boat upside down, Lindenberg is in serious trouble. This is an absolute disaster. It becomes apparent that Lindenberg is trapped underwater. Victims can drown or suffer brain damage in only a few minutes. The divers are finally able to free the trapped driver. As Goodwin and Newton hoist Lindenberg onto the rescue boat, they find a pulse, but he is not breathing. As an emergency team waits on shore, Andy Newton begins CPR. Finally, Lindenberg begins to breathe. But if the Osprey rescue team had taken even one more minute pulling him from the water, he would not have survived. Rugged Western Australia is the setting for the world's most dangerous whitewater competition, known as the Avon Descent. Vying for thousands of dollars in prize money, 800 competitors challenge 80 boulder-strewn miles of the Avon River. It's a death-defying race that many will never finish. Official rescuers are positioned at points along the course. The water is especially dangerous at a natural rock dam known as Extracts Weir. 23-year-old Lachlan Mills attempts to navigate his small kayak through the rocky falls. But the force of the water is too great. The power of the river presses Lachlan between his kayak and the rocks, holding him tight. As rescuer Tim Moore fights his way upstream, Lachlan disappears completely beneath the water. Tim attempts to pry the kayak from the rock, but the force of the water is too much. Suddenly, they get some unexpected help. The impact frees the kayak. Realizing that Lachlan is not breathing, Tim begins performing mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation in the water, trying to keep the young man alive long enough to get him to shore.
Finally, they make their way to the emergency rescue team on shore, and Lachlan begins to breathe on his own. Thanks to Tim Moore and his partners, Lachlan Mills survives his encounter with the Avon River. Creating movie magic often requires professional stunt people to confront the forces of nature. For the pros, it's all in a day's work. Everybody okay? But in this high-risk profession, no one can be too confident. This is going to be the last take on this, and if we don't get it, we don't use it. We don't go. Stuntman Bob Karpowitz straps himself securely into the stunt car as he prepares the next shot. During the chase scene, he will careen the car into the water. With the cameras rolling, the action begins. At first, everything appears to be going according to plan. But the crew suddenly realizes that Karpowitz is trapped upside down underwater, unable to get out, unable to breathe. The crew puts its rescue plan into action. But as stunt coordinator Ricky D cuts one strap, he can't find the second strap in the murky water. In the chaos, the rescuers are unable to get the oxygen mask to the stunt driver's face. Karpowitz is drowning. Ricky D uses his knife in a desperate attempt to cut the remaining strap. Does he got it? Does he got the air? Oh, do we need to push this thing on him? He's 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 but even with the training and experience of a professional crew, the force of nature can never be underestimated. The drive to challenge nature is as old as mankind. Veteran bungee jumper Greg Jones is determined to take this thrill to new heights by combining bungee jumping with skydiving. Connected by a 50-foot bungee cord, Greg and his partner Mike McGee jump in tandem. On cue, Mike will open his chute while Greg continues to free fall. When the cord tightens, Greg has the bungee bounce of his life. Invigorated by the experience, Greg and Mike decide to up the stakes. This time, they won't open Mike's chute until they reach terminal speed, 110 miles per hour. Cameraman Tim McMahon will videotape their attempt. Greg signals they've hit terminal speed and Mike pops his chute. The bungee cord breaks from the force of Greg's fall and strikes him in the face. Knocked unconscious, Greg drops like a stone for 3,000 feet. Fortunately, he briefly regains his senses long enough to open his chute. Cameraman Tim McMahon will collapses his chute and dives to the rescue. As Tim gets closer, he can see his friend is badly hurt. Tim hooks his feet onto Greg's parachute in an effort to control his drop. Greg, barely conscious, is carrying them towards a radio antenna below. Tim redirects the descent and Greg signals he's okay. Knowing that Greg can't land himself, Tim guides them down. Yeah, I'm, I'm fading back and forth though, Tim. At last, they touch ground. Thanks to Tim McMahon's calmness and quick action, Greg Jones will live to dare nature again. But parachuting can be risky even if you're not trying to be a daredevil. In Cambridge, England, veteran skydiving instructor Mike Smith readies his gear and prepares newcomer Richard Maynard for his first jump. Ronnie O'Brien dons a helmet-mounted camera to record the event. Excitement mounts as the plane climbs to 12,000 feet. 
To ensure Richard's safety, Mike will be physically attached to him throughout the jump. This is called tandem jumping and is a common introduction to skydiving. To compensate for the added weight of the tandem jump, instructors must first pull the drogue, a smaller parachute which will help slow the descent before activating the main chute. As planned, Mike pulls their drogue. But cameraman Ronnie O'Brien soon senses something has gone wrong. What he doesn't realize is that Mike is losing consciousness because the drogue has wrapped around his neck and is strangling him. As the tandem plummets out of control, student Richard Maynard is unaware anything is even wrong. Yet with every spin, the cord tightens and threatens to cut off his instructor's air supply. Risking his own life, Ronnie O'Brien moves in to help. Frantically, he untangles the drogue and reaches for the ripcord. <coughs> Ronnie shouts for joy because Mike and his student Richard will live to jump again. off New Guinea are home to a wide variety of sea life, but man's fascination with these creatures can lead to danger when we interact with animals in their habitat. Bob and Diana Halstead are professional underwater photographers. As they prepare for a dive in an area teeming with small fish, they are acutely aware that in these waters, wherever you find schools of fish, you also find sharks. For Bob and Diana, that's part of the attraction. A 10-foot silver tip shark approaches, attracted by the fish the photographers are using as bait. Several more sharks move in, and the mood quickly changes. Suddenly, real danger. In this rare footage of a shark attacking a human, Diana suffers a ferocious bite to her leg. Bleeding badly, she fights off the shark by shoving her heavy camera directly into its gaping jaws. The other sharks, frenzied by the smell of blood, move in from every angle. Aided by another diver, Bob struggles to help his wife through the shark-infested waters to safety. Though Diana survived the encounter, the incident underscores the respect we must have for animals in the wild. Narelle Stewart did not have danger in mind when she set out for a hike with her dog, Snook. But when the mixed breed fell into a creek, Stewart jumped in to save him and found herself in deep trouble. Rushing water from a recent storm sucked her into an underwater drain pipe, and the water pressure at its mouth holds Stewart in a tight grip. With the water almost above her head, rescue workers quickly try to find a way to keep the woman from drowning. Unable to pull Stewart out, rescuers next attempt to lower the water level. Rushing in to help, bystanders quickly use canvas tarps to form a human dam. At first, the dam does not appear to be working. But gradually, the power of the water begins to diminish. Firefighter Tom Dawson grabs Stewart's ankle, forcing it loose. Stewart's ankle is broken, but she is safe. And the residents of Brisbane prove that with unity and determination, people can stand up to the forces of nature. Right. 
In Tucson, Arizona, a 35-year-old man and his two teenage passengers discover that their pickup truck is no match for a flash flood. The driver tried to cross a flooded channel, but a sudden wall of water has left all three stranded in the swift current. Firefighters have anchored the pickup with ropes, but a sudden surge on this lifeline can snap it like a thread. As the victims cling to the truck's roll bar, the near freezing water exerts almost a thousand pounds of pressure on them. Despite the safety measures, rescuers must encourage the 16-year-old boy to jump from the truck. After holding on for over an hour, the first victim finally reaches safety. Like the others, he suffers from extreme cold and from exhaustion. The next lifeline is tossed out to 15-year-old Chris Moyers, who must also be urged to jump. Moyers comes out alive, but time is running out for the lone remaining victim. Where's he at? Victims often become delirious when they suffer a sudden drop in body temperature. The man appears not only terrified, but confused. A rescuer tries to reach him, but he is lost to the powerful current. Okay, we got one rescuer going down over there. As the man remains paralyzed with fear, Volunteer Richard Coons gets ready to risk his own life. Two more rescuers fight through the frigid water to offer assistance. Securing the man in a life vest, the rescuers prepare to pull him to shore. The rescuers who were swept downstream are also saved. Arizona firefighters and 250 feet of rope saved three lives, and three men learned a new respect for the power of nature. As flash floods strike northern Texas, a woman attempts to cross Spring Creek in her suburban and travel trailer. The floodwaters quickly engulf the two vehicles. As the floodwaters rise, Captain Malcolm Foster decides to extend the fire truck's ladder out to the trapped vehicle and attempt to lift the woman to safety. These ladders aren't designed for this type of rescue, and because of the risk, Foster insists on doing the job himself. As Foster swings over the water, the firefighters know that his weight could break the ladder. For now, the makeshift plan works. Foster reaches the two vehicles safely. But no one knows that the ladder can withstand the added weight of the victim. Inside the Suburban, Foster convinces Marguerite Johnson that her only chance is to get out now. They begin their terrifying journey back across the water. Suddenly, the ladder malfunctions. Spectators join in, helping to manually crank the ladder. Agonizing minutes pass, 
As the rescuers hold their ground, they slowly bring Foster and Johnson closer, but not far enough. Finally, they're home free, thanks to the ingenuity and bravery of Captain Malcolm Foster. Even in the largest cities, man cannot escape the destructive forces of nature. In New Delhi, India, firefighters respond to an alarm in a high-rise office building. Firefighters face unique problems fighting this type of fire. Falling water pressure makes it difficult to reach the flames, and the sheer heights involved often make it impossible to reach trapped victims. As the crowd watches in horror, fire and choking smoke drives many of the victims to the edge of desperation. Workers extend a steel pole from an adjacent construction site, attempting to reach the trapped victims with a construction basket. They come heartbreakingly close. The blistering flames push one man to a desperate act. The inferno has claimed its first life. The sense of urgency is now even greater as firefighters fear not only for those trapped in offices, but on the roof as well. Fearing that time is running out, the construction workers assemble a makeshift bridge out of rope, pipe, and bamboo. With rescue workers helpless on the ground, the fragile bridge becomes the last hope for many of the trapped workers. The construction workers maneuver their bridge 50 feet across the deadly 10-story drop. Now, in a matter of minutes, they will learn if their invention will enable them to save lives or cost them their own. With nothing to lose, Shalu Alex, a computer operator, sets out across the rickety bridge to safety. Amazingly, the bridge is holding together, and one by one, the evacuees reach the other side. It's a terrifying journey, but the trapped workers realize it's their only way out. Three people died and over a hundred were injured in the New Delhi fire. But thanks to the construction workers, countless others were saved. In Vancouver, British Columbia, we see firsthand that sometimes the most deadly force in nature is man himself. Vancouver police respond to an urgent call on the city's east side, where a divorced father, Richard Gaudry, reacts angrily after losing custody of his young son. Alpha 71, he's back at the window. Gaudry not only refuses to release 21-month-old Michael, but threatens to harm him as well. Police try to talk him into releasing the boy, and Gaudry responds by arming himself with a knife. No! No! As his threats become more violent, additional officers arrive and take position. The rescue team prepares a plan to lure Gaudry away from the child. For bait, they use the beer he's been angrily demanding. As Gaudry steps out for the beer, uniformed officers rush him, while Detective Bob Meanley races upstairs for the boy. Uh, 
meanly cradles little Michael in his arms while police arrest Richard Godfrey. They said there was no charges. Look at them. They're arresting. Sadly, this is not an isolated incident. He said something about they believe the man also wants to kill the child. A girl, little girl. Alerted by this 911 call, police in Burbank, California, discover this enraged husband clutching his four-month-old daughter, Raquel. The father threatens to jump and take the baby with him. But two policemen have entered the man's apartment and are waiting behind him unseen. Without a second to lose, officers desperately reach for the little girl. As police arrest her father, little Raquel is free. Miraculously, both of these children were unhurt during their encounters. In San Antonio, Texas, 16 straight days of rain have turned busy streets into swollen rivers, impossible to cross, as Charles Lovett is about to find out. Lovett tried to cross the washed out road, but he underestimated the powerful current and now he and three-year-old Charles Jr. are trapped. Citizens watch helplessly, unable to save them. Lovett tries to comfort his young son, while onlookers continue to struggle for a solution. But with none in sight, Lovett's fate hangs in the hands of nature. Anybody have some hope? Suddenly, the floodwaters surge. Lovett and his son are swept away. Miraculously, Lovett's truck catches on a railroad track and comes to a tenuous stop. But now they're stuck in rising waters, which begin to flood the truck's cabin. Rescuers throw ropes from the train trestle, but Lovett won't let go of Charles Jr. to grab them. Water continues to pour into the cabin, and time is beginning to run out. Risking their own lives, rescuers scramble into the unstable truck to save the boy and his father. As Charles Jr. clings to his rescuer, his father climbs to safety. Charles Lovett found out about natural disasters the hard way. He drove right into one. Fortunately for Lovett and his young son, there were courageous people around to give them both a second chance. Another group of brave and selfless volunteers were called upon to fight the mighty Tohican Creek in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. 20-year-old Scott Benner was rafting down the storm-swollen river when his inflatable raft overturned 
and he's now dangerously stranded in a tree. Volunteer rescue workers have responded to the scene, including lifeguard Kenny Durstein, an expert in swift water rescue. A lifeline is attached to the raft, but not to Durstein. That's a deliberate choice. Being tethered to a rope would mean risking entanglement or being pulled underwater by the force of the current. But the Tohican Creek proves too powerful, and the rescuer is suddenly washed downstream, where he will later be rescued. With darkness falling, the rescue operation becomes more dangerous with every passing minute. Rescuers run additional safety lines and a pulley system 80 feet across the creek. Paramedic Glenn Hall pulls himself out over the water only inches above the rapids. Hall's assignment was only to test the tension of the rope, but fearing that time is running out, he decides to make his way out to Benner. Hall uses every bit of his strength as he pulls himself along the nylon cable. Benner's been stranded for three hours and is wet, cold, and tired. Finally, Hall reaches his destination, but his mission and the danger that goes with it is far from over. The rescue team can only watch and wait as Hall puts his paramedic training to the test. Tahican Creek continues to rise and night has fallen. For Glenn Hall and Scott Benner, the moment of truth has arrived. Hall sends Benner across first. As he enters the water, Volunteers on shore begin to pull him in, but Benner can hardly hold himself up, and it appears as though the rope will give way. But the rope does hold for Hall as well as Benner, who has been saved thanks to the efforts of more than 40 volunteers. Of course, man is not the only animal that has to stand up to nature. In Wellesley, Massachusetts, a golden retriever named Sadie Lady went out for a walk on a frozen pond and found herself on thin ice. Fortunately, nearby residents saw her and called in the fire department for help. Coping with falling snow and icy wind, firemen break a path through the ice using a borrowed canoe and rake. It's a slow, frustrating process that takes up crucial time. At 12 years of age, Sadie Lady is long past her prime. Rescuers are amazed the old dog has the strength to survive in the freezing water this long. <laughs> Finally, the firefighters reach her. As firefighter Robert Clement holds on to Sadie, his partner races to paddle them back to shore. Fortunately, this is one time when man was a dog's best friend. In Minneapolis, Minnesota, similar conditions have led to a parent's worst nightmare. 
Warm weather had begun to thaw Lake Hiawatha the day Jeffrey Stein crossed the ice to retrieve stray golf balls. When he fell through, his friend ran for help. The ice makes it impossible for a boat to reach him quickly, so policewoman C.J. Irvine tries to make it to him on an inflatable raft. Officer Irvine now meets the same fate as Jeffrey. With the officer unable to get any farther, Jeffrey's survival now depends on one man, Captain Roger Matson. Matson and his partners finally break through and pick up speed as the boy fights exhaustion. Matson hooks the boy's jacket. <laughs> Jeffrey Stein's condition, while serious, is no longer life-threatening. But his close call is a reminder of just how dangerous frozen lakes and waterways can be. The wilderness is a place where trouble can strike swiftly sometimes with heartbreaking results. Ben Lockhart and his stepbrother Steve were rafting with Ben's young son Jesse when they launched their raft too close to the treacherous Dillon Falls. The river swept the raft over the falls, throwing the men and the small boy into the churning whitewater. A member of the Deschutes search and rescue team makes a startling discovery. Three-year-old Jesse Lockhart clings to a rock only inches above the raging whitewater where he's held on for almost two hours. Rescuers are amazed at the discovery. They had expected to find only bodies, not survivors. Guided by Lieutenant Dave King, firefighters Lance Dyer and Rob Cravens attempt to reach the boy before he lets go. Craven secure a rappelling rope on a tree high above the boy. With the rope secure and guided by Lieutenant King, Cravens attempts to position himself just above the small boy, who remains out of his sight. Trusting his life to his partner, and the strength of the ponderosa pine, Cravens makes his way down the perilous descent. The race to save Jesse is painfully slow. Cravens reaches the boy. Sadly, as three-year-old Jesse is pulled up, the bodies of his father and uncle are discovered downstream. It's a tragic lesson on the power of nature. Tornadoes are one of nature's most deadly phenomena. Striking sporadically and with incredible impact, they cause more deaths in the United States than any other weather event except lightning. In Wichita, Kansas, KSNW cameraman Ted Lewis and reporter Greg Jarrett 
are about to discover why this is one force of nature man never wants to confront. We're all right, just stay ahead of Their only hope is a distant freeway underpass. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lots faster, lots faster. Lots faster, Greg's catching us. You gotta go, buddy. You gotta really go. Several others also race for shelter, including high school teacher Butch Gilbert and his two daughters. Lewis continues to roll his camera as the others brace for the tornado's impact. They have survived a direct hit. Thanks to the bridge and their quick thinking, they have all survived one of nature's most deadly encounters. Oahu. The surf here has an ominous nickname, Killer Waves. 26-year-old Hugh Alexander and a friend were having their photograph taken when a powerful wave swept Alexander off the rocks and into the ocean, forcing him to take refuge in a deep-sea cave. Working from shore, lifeguards attempt to get a flotation belt to Alexander. He emerges briefly, struggling against the powerful surf. Under the crushing force of the waves, Alexander disappears back into the cave. Any hope of saving Alexander now rests with lifeguards Brian Kialana and Earl Bungo and their rather unusual rescue vehicle, Brian's jet ski. Despite the enormous risk, Bungo swims into the cave. Pounding surf forces Bungo to leave the cave before he can locate Alexander. As the tide continues to rise, wave after wave batters Hugh Alexander against the cave's interior rock walls. Suddenly, just as Kiolano was driving the jet ski toward safety, Hugh Alexander attempts another escape. Kiolano races back to his side, and Alexander manages to grab Bungo's outstretched hand. But the victory is brief. Bungo and Alexander lose their grip on the sled, perilously close to the rocks. Kiolano reappears with a jet ski just in time. After a two-hour struggle, Hugh Alexander is safely on shore. He survived thanks to lifeguards Brian Kialana and Earl Bungo. In Phoenix, Arizona, Nyung Tran made a mistake that now threatens her life. Before she realized the danger, a flash flood turned the road into a river, trapping the woman inside her submerged car. Because of the incredible force of the flood, the only way to reach the car is by helicopter. As rescue pilot Larry Hallis maneuvers closer to the buried car, firefighter Ron Cummings clings precariously to the chopper's wet skids. Putting his own life at risk, Cummings drops to the slippery roof of the submerged vehicle. With every passing second, Tran's car fills with freezing water. 
Cummings knows he has little time to lose. Fighting the flood's powerful current as well as raging winds, the firefighter secures a tenuous foothold. Fighting gusty winds, the helicopter struggles to maintain its position while Cummings grabs hold of a flotation device. As other rescue workers look on, Cummings pulls the terrified Tran out of her flooded car. As Cummings secures her safety gear, Tran informs him that she cannot swim. Helicopter pilot Larry Hallis maneuvers the chopper closer. But the furious wind buffets his machine and forces the pilot to abort. Hallis steadies the chopper for another attempt. At last, Cummings is able to hoist Tran on a wet skin. This time, man's ingenuity has saved the day. This tranquil waterway in Savannah, Georgia, seems far removed from danger. But when man takes to the water, obstacles can lurk everywhere. Debbie Oling was fishing when her boat smashed into a bridge piling and plunged her into the water. She grabbed onto the pilings where she is now trapped. Fisherman R.J. Smith has come to Debbie's aid. He secures the injured woman with a rope until more help can arrive. Help finally arrives in the form of a Coast Guard chopper as local rescue workers stand by, rescue swimmer Joseph Metzler prepares to begin his descent. The flight mechanic lowers Metzler into the dangerous maze of tangled ropes and interconnecting cross beams. He secures Debbie in a safety harness and attempts to cut away the ropes. Descent begins, Debbie still tethered to that dangerous third rope. But Metzler is about to learn how quickly a life-saving rescue can go wrong. The rope twists itself around Debbie's neck and upper body, binding her tight and strangling the life out of her. Metzler moves quickly to save her. Metzler struggles with a pair of wire cutters, desperately trying to cut the suffocating woman free. Finally, Metzler succeeds. Debbie is safely aboard, but for Joseph Metzler, it's a chilling example that no rescue is ever routine. Typhoons and hurricanes are one of the most deadly forces in nature, and very little made by man can stand up to their power. Typhoon Usang, also known as Typhoon Ruby, slammed into the Philippine island of Luzon with peak winds of over 75 miles per hour. Conditions are really too dangerous for aircraft to fly, but the air rescue squadron has been ordered to fly anyway in hopes of saving the most desperate victims. It's decided that women and children must be airlifted first. Inside the chopper, Sergeant Alfredo Rivoldo, working without a safety harness on a simple rope ladder, steps into the gusting winds, directly over floodwaters that continue to gain power and speed. He descends into the tangle of branches that has kept a mother and son from being swept away. The challenge now is to keep the rope ladder from snagging in the trees in the face of ferocious winds.
As Rivaldo attempts to keep the mother and child from falling, the pilot is fighting his own battle to stabilize the chopper against the typhoon's relentless fury. Finally, Rivaldo sets the mother and son down and returns to look for more victims. Surveying the scene, Rivaldo spots another woman as she clutches her tiny baby, a mother in desperate trouble. As the frightened woman clings to a tree, Rivaldo makes his way back down the ladder. The woman is cold and exhausted, but her child's condition is even more critical. The baby has turned blue from exposure. Rivaldo airlifts the baby first, not even sure if it's still alive. Rivaldo hands the baby over to the ground crew and returns for the mother. Incredibly, thanks to Sergeant Rivaldo, they and many others survived. Typhoon Usang claimed 28 lives. Fires, floods, storms, tornadoes, and other forces of nature claim countless others every year. Yet we need not fear nature, only respect it. Because to revere its grandeur and power is to be better able to live in harmony with it.